about everything. I said this morning, we talk about Jesus Christ, and God is a God of mercy. But you know, God is a God of justice also. This morning when we were door now coming to church, we came through Sail Creek, and anybody knows through Sail Creek, the speed limit's 45 miles an hour, right? Mm -hmm. Well, while we were cruising through there at about 50, <laughs> this car come buzzing by us, going, it's probably going 65, if he's doing anything. Well, I, I commented to Dora, I said, well, he's not concerned about any law enforcement. Sure enough, you made it through Sail Creek, no problem. So we came on up the road, and guess what? Just inside the city limits of Dayton, there the policeman had him pulled over. <laughs> so you know something? I'm sure he was demanding mercy, but I'm sure right now he's got justice. Amen? <laughs> we know that God is also a God of justice. You must, you must pay for your sins. Amen? Last night, I don't know how word is. Last night, I had a dream. Everybody said, well, I had a dream last night. Amen. Mm -hmm. But I had a dream. And even in my dream, the Lord said, you're too old. But what was happening in my dream, I was too old for it. I won't relate any more than that except that <laughs> My age, he said, you're too old. Yeah, oh. <laughs> so I got to thinking about that. You know, maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something. Maybe I'm too old to pastor a church. Maybe I should be thinking about going some other direction. Amen? I, I feel like I've let this church down. I really do. I, I, I just don't feel like I do enough. Amen? And uh, I want you to be praying in the days ahead. With my health going the way it is, uh, I said, uh, told, uh, we stopped and, and ate at Hardy this morning and ran into some friends of ours and told them, I said, you know, I take 14 pills every day. I cannot believe how much medicine that I actually take. And every once in a while, I have to take a stomach pill to counteract some of those. Would you be praying about it? I don't know. We'll just see what the Lord has. We'll see if he uh, helps my health or he says maybe go away. I don't know. But you all pray about it. Romans chapter 12 this morning. Everybody stand if you would. We'll just read just a few verses from chapter 12 in Romans. Starting in verse 6, he said, Having then the gifts different according to the grace that is given to us, with the prophecy let us prophesy, according to the proportion of faith. Our ministry let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, and he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let's look, pray, Lord, this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us every day. For allowing us just to live one more day to, to get to minister through your word this morning, Lord. Let it touch our hearts this morning. Open our eyes, our heart. Help us, Lord. Give us strength. Give us encouragement. For the things that we need, Lord, come from your word. And we need to ponder on it. We need to think about it. We need to read it, study it, and apply it to our hearts. Forgive us this day of any of our sins. For I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You can be saved. This morning I want to ask you, have you ever run into a person that when they, when they walk away, they when you talk to them and they walk away, you, you think to yourself, I'm glad I know that person. I'm just, I'm just glad I know him. He has just made my day. He has made me feel better. 
when he walked away. <clears throat> Just being around those kind of people, you find yourself challenged to do the will of God. They will, they will share Jesus with you, and you will be challenged to, to do what they would think you would do. You just want to be closer to Christ by them being associated with you. Or maybe you, you realize that you've got a bad habit of some kind, and they will help you with that habit. Or maybe, you, whatever it may be, when you walk away, you just, you just feel encouraged. Encouraged to go on just one more day, one more hour, one more time, one more song, one more, one more sermon, whatever it may be. They encourage you. They make you to de determine that I'm going to keep on going. I'm not going to quit. I'm just not going to do it. They energize you. They lift you up. So what is this? What are we talking about? We're talking about exhortation. The special ability to motivate people to serve God. These are church cheerleaders. They're motivators. And this is encompasses a lots of things that a motivator or a, or a cheerleader will do. They can give advice. They can give counseling. They're definitely encouragers. They strengthen us when we're down and they comfort us when we have problems. It's a common gift. Many are needed. The prophet proclaims, first of all, the truth. The teacher explains the truth, but the exhorter motivates us to obey the truth. The exhorter takes the truth of God and puts shoe leather, pit leather to it. If not for the gift of exhortation, we would have heads that are full of book knowledge but would never produce any fruit. The exhorter motivates us to be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. They teach us to, when we get on our knees and pray, when we get up from our knees, that we go out and do something about it. So many times we, we don't do anything about our prayer. So many times, and, and I preached this sermon once, that we need to get out of our comfort zone. An exhorter is one who will encourage you to get out of your comfort zone, to do something you've never done before. God lays all kinds of things on our heart. You know what we do with most of those things? We ignore them. We push them to the side, and that way, after a while, we forget them. We go on about our business, doing something else. And all the while, God was wanting us to do something else. I ran across this line from somewhere I read it. It says the exhorter has the ability to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. In other words, he spurs on those who just sit in their pew and do nothing. In this day and age, that gift is more needed than any time before. This is truly what we call the land of the sea in time. It's a time when we have lukewarm Christianity. We're not sold out on the word of God. We're not sold out on Jesus Christ. If we were, we'd be doing more than we're doing. And that's why I feel sometimes that I'm failing this church. I'm not doing all that I could do. I'm not saying I don't do a lot. I'm saying I'm not doing all I could do. An exhorter helps us to stay out of that comfort zone. We, we don't go to sleep on God. In other words, there's a person that prods you in the side and says, wake up, wake up. 
It's time to time to get up and do something. They sing songs like I'm pressing on the upward way. They'll encourage you to increase in what you're doing. Even in your devotion, your sacrifice, your holiness even. To live better lives each and every day. They encourage you. They encourage you to climb higher, higher. Run faster. And stay in it longer. The exhorter says you can do it. And you know what? Once they tell you that, then they come alongside of you and help you and walk with you. They make wonderful counselors. They're great. They're the ones who come to the altar. When somebody comes to the altar, they come to the altar also. They're encouragers. They're good in hospital visitation. Visiting the shut-ins, nursing homes. <clears throat> I read this supposedly a true story. A lady went to visit someone in the hospital, a woman that was in the hospital. And the two of them were got to talking, and the one that was visiting asked, uh, what was your affliction? What is your problem, you know? And so the lady recounts what was wrong with what the doctor has told her. He says, oh, yes, I, I've heard that. He said, my aunt died with that. Amen. That's not an exhorter. Amen. This morning we're going to be looking at a classic example of an exhorter. And that was the Apostle Paul himself. He uses the words exhort and exhortation over and over and over again in his writing. 2 Timothy 4 2, preach the word, be in some season, out of season, reproof, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Also in 1 Timothy 4 13, till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine, to correct not the gift that is in thee. Everybody, if you would, turn your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 13. Maybe we can follow along in some of these things. So this morning, we're going to look at some of the qualities, first of all, and then exhort. <clears throat> first thing I want to point out this morning is they jumped at the chance to express themselves. Okay? You have a testimony service, and I guarantee you they're the first one who raises their hand. They want to praise Jesus. They want to talk about Jesus Christ. They can't hurt, they can't hold it back. They have to do it. They will express themselves at the drum of a hat. They have bubbling enthusiasm. Talking, and especially talking about the Lord. Amen. They often accuse, first of all, of being too talkative. Dominate, sometimes they dominate the whole discussion. Constantly wanting to chime in and give their opinion. You might say they have a gift of gab. Have you heard that expression? Mm -hmm. This can be a liability also, though. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But Paul and Barnabas traveled together. But I want you to, if you look at Paul's writings, and, and you'll notice one thing. Barnabas hardly ever gets to speak. Paul does all the talking. Second thing, exhorter qualification is they're very expressive when they speak. Have you ever seen anybody that can't talk if they, if they can't move their hand? You ever seen? You ever seen that? I mean, when they, when they, when they say something, got 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 to have their hands going, and 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 you don't notice them when they pick up they pick up the telephone and they still got their hand going, and they know nobody can see that, but it's still going. They can't talk unless they got their hands moving. They're very expressive 
are demonstrative. I'll get that word out. When they speak, though, people will listen. Because they speak with authority. People are drawn to the words that they have. Paul tells them in, in several times here in Acts chapter 13, uh, verses 17 through 41. There you, Paul relates Bible stories to them. He leads them through Egypt, I mean through Israel's trials and tribulations and all the way through Egypt and how they're rescued and all that. It tells them lots of stories. Look with me if you would down at 42nd verse. He said, now when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. Now when the congregation was broken up, Many of the Jews' religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. They had heard Paul speaking, and they could realize, they realized that this man has the word. <coughs> he knows he has a word from God. So we need to listen to this man. He encouraged them. He says, next time, Preach to us. Tell us about Jesus Christ. Tell us about him. So who was impressed with it? Look at verse 44. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. This man was a speaker, wasn't he? <laughs> I think if I was a speaker, I could draw people to me. Amen. I feel like I'm running them away. Another qualification of an exhorter. They take the scripture and apply it in a practical way. You know something? Just knowing even the word of God, having head knowledge, even heart knowledge. If you don't do anything with it, you have wasted <coughs> God's word. Paul says, they were delivered from Egypt for what? What'd they do? What happened next? They ended up out in the desert, wandering around. They finally got out of the wilderness. And then they had a period of judges when they weren't listening to what God told them. So what they say? We want a king. They said, okay, that's good. You want a king? So what? What are you doing for God now? Look over in chapter 14. I'm sorry. Verse 13. He makes it practical. Look at back in verse 38. It said, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. And by him all that believe are justified from all things for which could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore lest that come upon you which is spoken of in the prophets. It makes sense out of what you're teaching. It makes sense out of what you're reading. Make it practical. Live your life by what the word says. He was never content with just preaching to the head or preaching to the heart. He wants to preach to the hand. In other words, get off and do something. Get your hands out of your pockets. We run around as Christians, they have our hands in our pockets. It's like we don't want to do anything. He wanted them to respond, to have a change of their will, to decide to react to the word of God. So many people come to the altar in, in, in the churches today. But you know something? They come and they pray a little prayer. And they get up and leave and then don't do anything about it. If you've got a struggle in your life, if you've got financial trouble, if you've got uh, marital problems, if you've got family problems, let me 
me tell you, you come down and you pray and you ask God to take care of it. But you know something? You need to do your part too. <laughs> if you got financial problems, you're in debt, you can't get out. Don't go out and spend more. Amen. We have people that do that. <clears throat> Be practical about it. An exhorter does this. First of all, they have little tolerance for teaching about being practical if it's if they're all you're ever preaching about is doctrine. And that's my problem. I want to preach doctrine. But we need to make it practical. Day to day lives. This is this is the way we are to live our lives. When I say we're to be happy, are you happy? If you're a Christian, that's more than you ought to be happy. You say, well, I got all kinds of problems. That's all right. God will take you through them. You ought to be happy about that. You know, problems don't last forever. You'll get through it. <coughs> I've had some problems that I thought were insurmountable. I got through them. I'm still alive. I'm still going. It's like this deal with my health. I'll get through it. I mean, I'll get something. If I don't, I'll, I'll live the way I am. I know I will. God will take care of me. An exhorter is very pragmatic. When they call upon, when they're called upon to teach a lesson, it'll sound like this. Well, you got worries? I got five or six different ways to help you with that. Amen. They give you, they give you some directions. You say, well, I got a leaky closet. How do I fix that? And they'll tell you, but they'll lay down a step. One, two, three, four. When you get down to the four steps, it's done. It's fixed. But you got to follow those steps that way. No qualifications. They're very confident. They never get discouraged. Lord, I wish they had that sometimes. Lord, I get discouraged sometimes. But by far, this is probably their greatest asset. You just cannot give them down. No matter what the circumstances, you just can't give them down. Paul was that kind of an exhorter. He responded to discouraging circumstances. Look at verse 45. He said, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. <coughs> Did Paul quit? But then it is discouraging. When you preach, you get, in, you get up here and you preach and, you, and the next thing you know, somebody's talking about it. Well, he didn't do this or he didn't say that. He should have said this. Well, I wonder why he didn't say that. You know what could be, there's nothing that could be more discouraging than to really talk about the Lord and really be sold out on Jesus and then somebody throws water on it. Amen? So how did Paul respond? Did he run? Did he quit? Verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you. No, he said, Oh, we just got bolder. In other words, we're not going to quit. Look at verse 50 with me. I like this one too. It said, But the Jews stirred up the devout and the honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. You know, I've known some preachers that got fired. <laughs> some preachers that they run off, amen? But it didn't, at least they didn't run them out of the country, amen? They just run them out of the church, not out of the country. And then verse 51 and 52, but they shook off the dust of their feet. Against them came the Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost. How do you respond? You have joy in your heart. You just go on, okay? Look at verse 19 in chapter 14. And there came thither Jews, certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded 
The people in having stone ball drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. You know, if you'd been beat like he had, stoned, and left for dead, you'd get a little discouraged, wouldn't you? I'm going to ask you this morning, what does it take for you to make you quit? To quit serving God. What does it take to make you quit? I'm telling you, it's a very, today, it, it sure don't take much to get people to quit serving God. <clears throat> people come to church looking for a problem, looking for something they have an excuse to quit. They come looking for it. And you know something, if they look for it, they will find it. They will find something. The real test of your character is what it takes to make you quit. The greatest asset of an exhorter is that you can't, it's hard to discourage them. They're also results oriented. They take delight in seeing people grow in Jesus Christ. They like to see people make mature decisions, to grow and mature, make decisions, make progress. So we saw the definition, the description, and now let's look at the dangers of being an exhorter. Some liabilities of an exhorter. Remember this, Satan is looking for an excuse, some way, just some way to take a positive gift and turn it into a negative way. The first one is, and I've been guilty of this myself, they have little tolerance for one who quits their faith. Church, you have to forgive me, but I've said this. Someone leaves out the church doors and don't get mad, don't come back, whatever. I'll go visit one time. But I don't beg. I don't beg. Okay? Maybe I should. Maybe I should beg them to come back. I don't know. We have it in our hearts sometimes that when they fail, we feel like we fail too. The exhorter takes it personally and take responsibility. If you remember on their uh, John Mark went home after the first missionary journey. He was traveling with Paul and he went home. So here they are on the second missionary journey. And guess what? That one act caused the church to split, didn't it? Paul did not want John Mark with him because he quit. He went back home. But he told him not to come. But we find it later on in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that Paul says it is profitable to have John Mark around. He realized he was too hard on him and too hard on himself when he told John Mark to head out. Exhorters, <clears throat> it's hard when they see somebody fail. When they've worked with somebody for three months about changing their lives, about doing this, and they ignore them and go their other way. Sometimes we get the feeling, well, I didn't do enough. I didn't, I, I, I didn't do it. I wasn't there enough. They needed me more or something. When all the time it's not their fault. But we feel guilty ourselves. Now I'm acting like I'm an exhorter. I'm not there. Okay. They also emphasize on steps of action. And they may what I call oversimplify the problem. People are human. You can't make nothing else out of them. And they don't always go one, two, three, four, five in steps. 
Sometimes they go to five, back to one. It, they just skip all around. Amen? An exhorter has it laid out what they should do, step by step. You know something? Sometimes them step by step, when you get to the end, it don't work out. It don't come, it don't come out right in the end. Have you ever uh, followed a recipe in a recipe book? And you, you followed it step by step by step, but then the end product didn't come out like it thought it was going to come out. I can pick on my wife this morning. I remember one time she made this beautiful, beautiful coconut cake. A layered coconut cake. This thing was about this time. It was beautiful, covered in coke, beautiful. But left it sitting in the kitchen. She come back through. You know what her cake did? It went, <laughs> it split in the middle. For no reason, it just sat there and split. But my wife's resourceful. She took that cake and made it into a trifle. Amen. So anyway. <laughs> She followed directions just right on the cake to make it right. It should have been fine, but it fell apart anyway. That's what happens to an exhorter. They tell you how to step, what you should do. You should do this now, and you should do this, and you should do this. And it should turn out right. Now. Oh, that's true. Third problem with an exhorter is they tend to give advice when they didn't ask for. Amen. An exhorter will see somebody's having a problem. They're struggling. Maybe they have financial problem. Maybe they have some other problem. Isn't it? And we want to run in and help and say, oh, you've got to do this. You got and they didn't ask for our help. <laughs> we start giving it to them anyway. And you know what people do then? Back up, stay away from me. They start shunning. They start going the other way. We need to learn to, when someone asks for help, be there. Someone even, even gives you an inkling they could really need some help. We ought to be there right beside them. But until they give that, you need to pray for them. Don't interfere. Sometimes an exhorter will interfere in somebody's life and what they're struggling with. And they'll end up resenting you more than they did their problem. And then the last point this morning. An exhorter has a tendency to annoy people. First of all, by being too talking or too overly enthusiastic. This is the type of guy who wants to why would you say, encourage me when there's nothing wrong? <laughs> when everything's going great, they're still wanting to encourage me. And I can tell you this, just because you have the gift of gab, not everybody wants to hear it. Because not everybody has the gift of listening. Thank God that you have this wonderful gift of exhortation. Truly, there, there's a lifeblood of any church. They're the ones who send the cards who need it. They're the ones who give compliments at the drop of a hat. They're the ones that give up the body of Christ a shot of beach water. And they're very good at re reproducing themselves and others. They're full of enthusiasm. Enth enthusiasm is just like a wildfire. It spreads. If somebody sees you happy and you're enthused, guess what? That spreads. It spreads to the next person. And that's what we need in church. Everybody stand. Let's get out the song of invitation just in case somebody wants to come and pray this morning. I encourage you to do it if you do, but remember this. Put some feet to your prayer. Let God, help God with this. It's not right to just sit on you. Well, just to see.
Okay. God, I'm having problems. I don't need that. Page 65 in the church hymnal.